Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Janet Douglas, and I'm a member of the Thornsbury Society. Now, you possibly weren't expecting me to be the speaker today. Uh, the speaker who was advertised as giving this talk, who is Irish and I'm not, uh, is not, not able to be with us. And I talked about cancelling the meeting, and then I realised I'd got quite a lot of Irish material. So I'm really the substitute for the speaker. <laughs> and I'm talking on a rather different topic. He's an expert on, on Irish politics, and I'm not. So I'm giving a much more general talk, hence the very general title. Um, and uh, it's a bit different than, than what he would uh, be giving you. Um, really, my slot is next week when I'm talking about the Chinese in Leeds, a very different sort of topic with a very different flavour to it than, in fact, this afternoon's talk. Now, until the economic boom of the 1990s onwards, emigration was a common theme in Irish history. And most Irish families will have people who've moved away from the Emerald Isle and gone somewhere else. Uh, obviously, they moved in these vast numbers because they were driven by unemployment, poverty and famine. I'm going to change the back. Um, between 1801 and 1921, at least 8 million Irish men and women left Ireland to make their home, particularly in the United States of America, which has a much bigger Irish population proportion than we do in, get in England or, the, uh, or in Britain. Although obviously Britain is much nearer. But also you get large numbers in Australia, you get some in South Africa, throughout the form of British Empire, as well as the United States of America. As late as 1926, a third of native-born Irishmen were actually living abroad. And that's not accounting for second generations and third generations who are living in places like Boston and so on. Although less studied by historians, and despite, or perhaps because of, the Irish Free State establishment in 1921, there was considerable emigration to Britain from Ireland in the 1930s. And I'm not going to actually talk about that as the title indicates. And then again, you get a considerable wave of migration in the 1950s. In the 1971 census, there was recorded just short of a million Irish-born people living in Britain in 1971. And again, this is a problem with the census figures. They tell you where somebody was born. They don't tell you if you're Irish born in Liverpool or Birmingham or Leeds. So the numbers is much, much uh, larger than in fact the census figures indicate. And people have tried to give guesstimates of how many people in uh, Britain have an Irish origin and they come up with a uh, Irish pedigree and they come up with a figure of 15 million. Uh, so a considerable number of our relatives, neighbours, friends and so on will have Irish blood in them somewhere along the line. Now, it, usually those people who study migration, particularly Irish migration, talk about different waves of migration over historical period. So what we find, the first wave comes before the famine. Uh, it's in the years around the Napoleonic Wars and post-Napoleonic Wars, when there was economic depression in Ireland at that stage, uh, particularly because of the destruction of the Irish textile industry, and that brought thousands of migrants from the west of Ireland in particular, into the textile areas of Lancashire and Yorkshire. Then we get the much more famous migration that's associated with the Great Famine of, 1940, of 1845 to 49, which resulted in the Irish population in Ireland plummeting from 8.2 million in, 19, in 1851 
to 5.8 million in, 50, in 1850, sorry, I said tall again, plummeting from 8.2 million in 1841 to 5.8 million in 1851, um, so that you know, they're losing roughly 3 million people as due to the famine. Um, and uh, in terms of the numbers of Irish residents in England and Wales, their numbers increased from just short of 300,000 in 1841 to about uh, half a million or so uh, in, in fact, eight, uh, in 1851. Um, and as I've already mentioned, although the post famine years are usually considered as a period period when Irish immigration is at its uh, zenith. In actual fact, it continues years after the famine, and the highest number of people who are emigrating from Ireland to Britain actually occurs not in the years after the famine, but actually in the 1880s. Uh, and this is due really to changes in Irish agriculture, uh, which is clearing people who were peasant farmers away from the farms, leaving them with little option except to emigrate. Then when we get to the 1890s, you begin to see a fall in the numbers of Irish emigration to Britain. Um, and I've already mentioned, you've got waves in the 20th century, in the 1930s and the 1940s. Now, if we look at Leeds, the history of the Irish in Leeds is a microcosm at this general pattern of migration, which I've just mentioned. Leeds had a significant Irish community from the 1820s, which dramatically increased in the years following the Great Hunger and began to peter out in terms of numbers as the 19th century drew to a close. But then again, <coughs> in Leeds, we get more immigrants in the 1930s and again in the 1950s and 60s. The 1841 census records that, remember the 1841 census is pre-fund. So in 1841, there were 5,000 Irish-born people living in Leeds. It was 6% of the population. So they're not in fact here in very small numbers. They're here in fairly large numbers from the beginning of in fact the census records. Some of these people who were here pre famine had been attracted by becoming navvies in the building of canals and later railways. Uh, but many of them, particularly the ones who come to the West Riding, were hand loom weavers in Ireland that had been really uh, driven from Ireland because of changes in Britain's um, uh, economic policies regarding Ireland which meant that the Irish market was flooded with cheap textiles, industrially manufactured textiles, from in fact Lancashire and Yorkshire. And it just decimated the native Irish trade. And so they had little choice, but in fact to colour, to flee. The Great Famine doubled the numbers of Irish-born population uh, in Leeds. And by 1861, there were 10,333 Irish-born people living in Leeds. Now, again, remember, they're Irish-born. They're not accounting for the children and the grandchildren of those who came in the 1820s. So the population was considerably more um, than, in fact, the census is revealing. And probably by this time, there are 50, 15,000 people of Irish birth in Leeds and it's 7% of the population. The reason they become, I suppose, so shall we say, we, I will use the word notorious, uh, that seems to fit, is because they all lived in, they were highly concentrated and they lived in the area known as the Bank. Now, some of you won't know where the Bank is. I mean, it was largely clear in the 1930s and then, uh, then immediately after the first, Second World War. And not only was it cleared of houses, the churches still remained actually, but it was cleared of houses, but it was actually renamed. 
it had such a poor reputation that nobody wanted to go and live on a place as notorious as the bank. Um, it's now known and called Richmond Hill, which has a very different sort of <laughs> flavor, doesn't it? Um, now, I can't see the screen very well, but I'm hoping you can. This is the bank in 1850, uh, 51. Um, it's the area that is bordered by Marsh Lane. Then you've got East Street, which is following the valley of the air. Um, and then at the top, you've got things like Upper Accommodation Road and Pontefract Lane. It's that, well, it's sort of roughly sort of uh, triangle. Uh, and there were also people actually not on the bank, but nearer to the parish church as well. Um, so that's what he looked like in 1851. Can yes? I point out Musgrave? Is the Earl of Musgrave, who was governor of Ireland, has got Musgrave bold. Was he really? Thank yes. you. I didn't know that. <laughs> He's a grandparent of mine, but they're. Oh, well, that's 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 And that's what it was like in 1897. Uh, so it was already crowded, it becomes even, even more crowded um, <clears throat> as we come to the end of the century. The bank in contemporary writing was rapidly becoming synonymous with poverty, disease, drunkenness and crime. And the Reverend Edward Jackson of St James's Church, a church that's no longer there, but was roughly by the side of the market, very close to the parish church. And I'm not going to go off a detour about why those two churches were so near to each other. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the Reverend Edward Jackson was a very uh, eminent clergyman in Leeds, and these are his recollections of 1847, and they do provide us with a vivid picture of the famine fleeing Irish. They were tall men with long coats and hats without crowns, and women wild and haggard with numbers of unearthly looking children. <laughs> Strange beings that ran alongside the men and women and looked at you out of the corner of their eyes with a sort of half frightened, half savage expression. <laughs> um, now, he's a crazy man. He's concerned with his the Irish. So, uh, I'll just show you. These are some pictures from the um, illustrators and the news, and they just sort of how accurate they are, how much artistic license I haven't the foggiest idea. But this is what people in England would be looking at and thinking that's what the family's like, and more importantly, that's what the Irish are. So you can see where Edward Jackson's uh, image of the Irish fits in. Actually, I can't see it, but it's leaving Ireland, isn't it? Um, now, the bank was already one of the poorest districts in Leeds, even before the arrival of the Irish. It was actually home to the surviving Leeds handloom weavers, who were rapidly, because of the mechanisation of factories, were rapidly, in fact, uh, becoming poor and poorer. The bank was also the site of some of the very early factories in Leeds. Most of them now gone, but one or two still there and converted into rather posh ones, as you might imagine. Um, but that wasn't, posh anything wasn't typical of the bank. Uh, the area was filled with small back-to-back -back houses, usually about five yards square, normally two rooms, but sometimes with a cellar. Uh, so you had a cellar, the room it was always referred to as the room because it served so many different purposes, and then a bedroom over it. Locally, they were always called cottages, which has always seemed to me a misnomer 
we don't call them cottages in Lancashire, or not in my part of Lancashire anyway, <laughs> have we ever called them cottages? Um, and these houses, instead of being arranged along streets, as we might expect, and it's certainly our image of back to back later on, where there are, you know, geometric layouts, uh, but here they're not usually arranged in streets. They're built round courtyards. Uh, and one courtyard might lead to another courtyard, might lead to another courtyard, and it'd be a long time before, in fact, you'd actually connect with the streets. They lacked all water supply, they lacked drainage, any sanitary facility, and an obsession of the Victorian public health reformer, there was very poor ventilation. Now, a campaigning journalist from, in fact, the Morning Chronicle, wrote a series of articles uh, in the wake of his visit to Leeds in 1849. And he says, and I should be quoting from here a fair bit, that the town looked like it was built in a slimy box. Um, the rents were usually low for these houses. Now, I'm not very good in translating old money into new money. I still think that was new money. Uh, but the rents were from about nine pence a week to three shillings a week. It varied quite considerably. Um, and of course, it was the cheap rent, cheap accommodation, and the work opportunities that in fact brought the Irish to the bank, as I said, from the 1820s well into the 20th century. And once in fact a settlement begins, of course, it acts as a magnet for more immigrants, which is common to all immigrants. Uh, not just, it's not to the Chinese, by the way. So you have to come next week to find out why. They're different. Uh, but what, what you get is what's called chain migration. You send for other members of your family. You send for, in fact, your friends. You send for your neighbours. Or they say, can we come and join you? So it's a reciprocal arrangement. And obviously, it means that newly arrived immigrants have got some sort of material support from, in fact, those who came earlier on. They've got companionship. And, of course, some of the Irish at this stage, when we're talking about the middle of the 19th century, didn't actually speak English. As we'll see, they all, virtually all, came from the West Coast. <clears throat> Uh, they're not, in fact, people from Dublin and stuff, or Cork or anywhere around there. They're coming from County Mayo, from Sligo, and they're also coming from Tipperary, which is not going to be with the boys last there. Uh, and it's a very strange and different environment when they arrive here. Uh, detailed analyses of settlement patterns in Leeds indicate that people from particular villages inhabited particular streets on the back. It's that closeness that yeah, you begin to occupy the whole street. And one of the examples is Elm Street on the back, where the majority of residents in that uh, street came from, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it properly, Roskia, which is in northern North Pereira. And the whole street, they probably all knew each other when they were back in Ireland as sort of bears. Um, the Irish were always firmly rooted on the lowest rung of the economic ladder. ladder. They experienced <clears throat> low wages, casual work, spells of unemployment. Initially, the adult males tended to work as hungry weavers, often working as outworkers to the factories that already existed in these, particularly on the bank itself. Um, their women and children worked usually in the factories. The men didn't, the women and children did. And this is an area which was full, became full, a flax factory. Uh, and this is primarily where they worked. Robert Baker, who some of you will know, in a very impressive statistical survey of these in 1839, again, note we're pre coming there can be little doubt that the indigenous population of Leeds has hitherto been insufficient for the, for the various manufacturing purposes 
for which labour is required. We are indebted to the Irish peasantry for this extension of sometimes the manufacture, the flax spinning and the worsted spinning trade of Leeds and Bradford in periods of great demand, they have derived material assistance from immigrant labour. So much so as to have relieved the uh, relief from a pressure that uh, that which uh, would have been exceedingly detailed uh, the operation of uh, uh, mechanization. So what he's talking about is the demand for labor in these new factories. And he's saying that it is the factory owners in a way who in fact are bringing the Irish to Leeds, but demand for labor fluctuates as the economic cycle changes. So sometimes there, there really are many of them in casual work, which means that when you get to the depression of say the 1840s, the Irish will be dismissed. Uh, so you know, they're casual workers, they've got not much security. To use a Marxist term, the Irish serve as a reserve army of labour to British industry. Uh, you use them when you need to expand your industry, when in fact you don't, when your industry is retracting, you get rid of them. Um, so that, <clears throat> again, I'm going to quote now from Angus Bertoon, um, who is focusing here on the points of the Irish inhabitants in Leeds. In Leeds, I have for the first time found considerable numbers of Irish men steadily working at the room. Remember, he was writing in 1849. Most of them had learned the work at home, and he was Ireland. Uh, most of them had learned the work at home and had followed the track when they left their shores. They had the same story to tell, a scanty work and wages alone. I found many of these weavers employed upon the coarser stuff, such as sacking and canvas. One of them said that 40 of his countrymen, whom he knows were working in Leeds, and that they sent their children to the flax mills. The Irish, however, he added, who came from parts of the country where there had never been manufacturing, often kept their children at home and bred them up to any sort of little trade which they themselves followed. This is a species of education, which I suspect, suspect is very often equivalent to breeding up the children with no trade at all. Now, Leach goes on to describe three trades where the Irish particularly predominated. Rag picking, which is for the manufacture of shoddy. Untwisting old ropes, which is usually referred to as open. And mat making. Men and women generally work at the latter employment, but the women almost invariably hawk the product about for sale. I visited two cellars in one of the Irish streets, in each of which I found a man and a woman preparing mats. A sentence of description will suffice for both apartments. They might have been seven feet square, littered with old bagging, Russian mats, old rope, shaving, shaving, furnished with rickety deal tables, two or three chairs, more or less dilapidated, and a bed, in one case spread on a low frame, in the other rolled up in the corner. The cooking apparatus, in both cases, consisted of a single pot. The woman in the next cellar hawks larger mats in the better neighbourhoods. She was a buxom dame from Sligo, with a broad, with broad shoulders and a quick tongue. Her statement was to this effect: "I sell mats for as much as I can obtain. Have no fixed price. I ask as much as I think there is a chance of getting, and then beg. Um, if I make a good day sale in the morning, I sell cheaper in the afternoon. Sometimes we're very poor." and have only a little bread and coffee. But sometimes when we're in luck, we want for nothing. I think their concept of wanting for nothing is a rather normal action. Um, one day last week, I walked to Tagcaster 
with six maps. That's 14 miles there and 14 miles back, 14 miles back. I took six maps with me and sold five. They came one with another to five shillings. The highest price I've ever got for a road map is about two shillings. The sacking maps may fetch sixpence apiece. Now, many of the observers of the Irish families in Leeds comment on the lack of furniture in Irish houses, always a sign of poverty. Often a bed was a luxury, and whole families slept on straw and covered themselves with old clothes. Small though their houses were, they often was more than ten, more, uh, more than one family in them. And in fact, one of, the bank was particularly bad in, in many of the houses. There were 10 people living in these very tiny houses, which I've described earlier. Another feature which was much discussed in contemporary writing was the Irishman and the pig. Pigs often lived alongside the family, being turned out during the day to scavenge for food. This is again reach and describe uh, and quoting. Before almost every house, there lies, of course, until the pig comes for it, a deposit of a little heap of boiled out tea leaves. Again, to quote from the reach, I see that they, the pigs, are more common in some parts of Leeds. So I think they're, I think. Pigs are more common in these parts of Leeds than dogs and cats are in others. And wherever they abound, that's pigs, the population is the filthiest, the houses are the smallest, the rooms are the closest, and the most overcrowded. Um, well, I've got one or two photographs to give you some sort of impression. But we are talking later, of course, in the middle of the tension. We're talking really about the 1880s, probably 1890. But these are showing you how, in fact, the houses were not on streets, but in these yards. And you'll see there actually are different kinds of housing. Um, This was just off East Street, I can remember. And you can see, I don't really know the land that uh, East Street, you've got the uh, the air at the bottom, and then the land rises up to where, in fact, Mount St Mary's is, which I will be talking about in a minute. And this is one of the yards between East Street and where Mount St Mary's is going to go. Is that the one that shows the privies? I can't see them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, that's a lodging house because young men who came alone and didn't have anybody who could help them out on the back stayed in lodging houses uh, and slept in dormitories. Mm. That's right. Um, Now, the Irish were actually described as a problem. It's not surprising. Uh, they were a problem politically, uh, and we'll come to that in uh, a moment or two. But the hostility of the English to the Irish has a very long history. I mean, they're discussed in rather derogatory terms in the Middle Ages, as indeed the all camps, although they do have a bit of a difference but they are lumped together with the Scots and the Irish and are definitely inferior to the English. Uh, and it's taken a long time, perhaps we haven't achieved that sense of equality. Uh, so they're despised as being primitive, dirty, tribal, violent and backward. The wild Irish were favourite objects of ridicule. Paddy might be an innocent buffoon, or else a wily, feckless rogue takes me to drinking and brawling. The arrival of Falconry and Irish immigrants, freedom from starvation and eviction, 
in the period following the famine gave fresh currency to these narrative uh, negative stereotypes. Now remember, the Irish were British after the after 70s, so with the Scots and the Welsh have been for a long time. Uh, so they are British, I don't think we can use the word citizens, but they are in uh, of Great Britain. Uh, but they are also different. They have their own culture, they have their own lifestyles that differs from, in fact, the British and even the British working class. And so they're often treated with suspicion and hostility. And in the minds of British, of English people, they came to be associated with three rather familiar problems. Think of other immigrants who created them. They're associated with dirt and disease. They're associated with funding of the public authority. And they're associated with crime and drugs. Um, now, the cholera comes to me first in 1833, and I go back to the estimable Robert Baker. In his report to the Board of Health about this first cholera outbreak, he describes how the first case occurred in the Bluebell Fold, a small dirty yard on the bank, containing 20 houses inhabited by poor families, most of whom are Irish. The first person to die in the cholera outbreak of 1833 was a two-year-old child of Irish parents. And the disease was declared in the lives of 600 Irish people out of a total of 2,000 cases. Primarily, it ravaged the East End of Leeds, where the Irish were concentrated. As Baker, as I've already noted, Baker was a rather an objective observer, and in his report doesn't draw any the sort of conclusions as others might draw from the connection between the cholera and, in fact, uh, the Irish. He doesn't put the blame on the dirtiness or the bad habits of the Irish. He blames the landlords. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole tenor of his report is that it is basically the fault of greedy landlords who are building poor quality housing mm -hmm. with no amenity. And his second um, observation is that if landlords uh, can't provide decent housing and decent environments for people, then she's up to town, town council to do so. So he's got two ogres, as it were, the landlord and the local authority, who is doing absolutely nothing at all about all this. Um, 14 years later, in 1847, the typhus appears in these in a particularly aggravated form. Typhus was a common disease, uh, but it was also very interestingly always known as the Irish fever. So there was that sort of association between typhus and the Irish. Um, now, whereas cholera is a disease carried by polluted water, which is like a drainage on the bank and so on, although that wasn't known in 1833, typhus was an organism transmitted from an infected body by life uh, and spread very rapidly in impoverished and overcrowded houses, like on the bank. Here again is the Reverend uh, in his memoir. Here in this district, which was one of the especially Irish character, it was simply horrible. Every place above ground and underground was crammed and miserable. Famished wretches, scarcely looking like human beings. In one cell, we counted 31 men, women and children, all lying on a damp, dirty floor, with only a few handfuls of straw under them, whilst their frightened neighbours, who wouldn't venture into the cellar, lowered water in buckets to allay the intolerable thirst of these miserable people. Following this particular serious type of outbreak, within a year, there was a second uh, <coughs> ravage of, of in fact, the cholera. And again, the East End of Leeds bore the brunt of the casualty. Um, so that you've got, again, this is so people drawing this association between these killer diseases amongst the Irish in the bank where the Irish congregate and they are making the correlation, Baker one, a correlation 
between the two. Now, I haven't got time to go on uh, about uh, the poor relief of the workhouse, but this was certainly uh, a problem that people commented on. But I want you now just to turn to crime. The local press of the mid 19th century was full of reports of Irish drunkenness and criminal activity. The two are continually associated with each other. I take the case that simply it ran <laughs> from a mercury. It's the 8th of January, 1856, and the article is headed, absolutely typically, a wild Irishman. Mm. Uh, and the wild Irishman is a man called Anthony Timlin, alias O'Brien. Uh, so I don't know anything about that. Uh, he was a newly imported Irishman, and he was placed at the bar of the Leeds Courthouse on Saturday night, at about seven o'clock, he was sufficiently drunk to be perfectly boiling over with pot valour and senseless rage, and he commenced running them up at everyone he met. Just as he was going swimmingly, imploring men, women and children, policemen came to arrive to the rescue uh, and speedily put a stop to his lawlessness. Now, Tim Lynn received a sentence of three months in prison, but he's brawling. But at least it seems that Tim Lynn was fighting with his fists and not with anything else. So what you often get, in particularly personal quarrels between the Irish on the bank, is fighting with clubs and knives, which obviously can have a much more serious effect. Um, in fact, the, according to the book, Murder it, if police tried to arrest an Irishman, right, 200 people would gather, and his fellow countrymen would gather <laughs> and try to rescue him from the hands of the police. Um, in 1852, for instance, a third of those arrested for the crime of common assault, assault on the police and breach of the police, were, of the police were Irish. Uh, and there was not just the fact brawling and uh, things like assault, there was more general criminal activity, petty thieving, pickpocketing, illegal, illegal distillation of drink and prostitution. It's perhaps not surprising that the largest um, police station in Leeds, outside the city centre, was on Marsh Lane, next to that. Um, and it was all said that policemen didn't go on to the out onto the bank alone. They always went in part. Uh, it was considered a very dangerous um, place to go. There are different ways of interpreting this Irish reputation for fighting and crime. Now, in the statistical report of 1839, admittedly, we're talking about a slightly early period. Um, he look, um, Baker looks at crime and he very rationally points out that the Irish are no more criminally inclined than the Indians. What they are is they're of a different age and generation profile. So you can't just compare the situation criminal statistics in areas where, in, in the Periods of time where you get a lot of young men, particularly unmarried men with no children, but men at a particular age, then in fact crime flourishes. And it's true to them, exactly the same, and we know. Uh, but it was true, Robert Baker was pointing this out in 1839. Uh, whereas could you compare it with the, uh, with the English, the indigenous population, they don't have this high concentration of young men. They have a different sort of demographic profile. And therefore, you would expect to find more crime among the Irish than you would among the English, because you're not comparing like with like. Um, so it's very easy to exaggerate the criminal, um, uh, <laughs> the criminal characteristic of the Irishman. Now, I'm coming now to the role of religion. What you can see here is some, a building that probably none of you recognise. 
because we're not there any longer, but if you think Patrick's Church, it's the first Irish church, it was the first church built especially for the Irish, and it was on York Road, um, rather higher up than the present building that in fact was St Patrick's Church. Now I think the relationship between in fact the Irish immigrants and the English community was exaggerated, uh, aggravated by religious difference. Ill feeling between Protestants and Catholics was fed by all sorts of suspicions and um, uh, in terms of the Irish, the idea of Catholic repression is also associated with issues of national security. And although with great difficulty, uh, the Catholic Emancipation Act was passed in 1829. Um, the apex, I think, of hostilities to Roman Catholics in the 19th century reached its apex. In fact, in some ways, you could describe it as hysteria in the middle of the 19th century. We already emancipated Catholic churches, they could be built, which explains why this one is built in, 19, in 1831. But what happened in the 1840s was a group of Anglican clergymen associated with the Oxford movement, sometimes referred to as the Tractarian, converted to Catholicism, with, in fact, a great deal of publishers. Uh, so these top class theologians who were associated with the Anglican church should have been moved over to Catholicism. And they take with them and quite a large number of supporters. Uh, so there's this fear of Catholic taking their bread. Um, and that's made worse in 1850, when in fact the Pope restores the Irish hierarchy to Britain. Before that, there were no bishops or anything like that, and no archbishops. But the hierarchy is restored, and the first archbishop of Westminster is appointed by the Pope. So the threat of a papal Catholic takeover seemed very real to certain army Protestants. And anti-papish lecturers, poor Britain, defended the Protestantism of the Bible and the liberty of England against the yoke of Romish uh, priesthood and their inveterates. Uh, and these Protestant um, ultra Protestant um, uh, publishers called working class areas in Yorkshire and Lancashire, um, uh, and they particularly went to working class places. But the Catholic Church itself was a very important in institution within the Irish Catholic working class culture. In an unfamiliar environment, and not a hostile environment, it needed both spiritual and material support at an individual level, and also it helped to create a sense of community amongst the distressed and disorientated people. Indeed, there was one small Catholic chapel, which actually predates emancipation, that was built in Lady Lane, for St Mary. Uh, but um, the, um, this is the, uh, the St Patrick, name tells you who it was intended for. Uh, St. Patrick was built in 1831. Uh, so again, we're long before the famine. Um, the church, which we now call the Catholic Cathedral, was built in 1838. Um, but it was a bit far away, a bit posh for most Irish Catholics, actually. Uh, and I think still is in some quarters. Uh, there was no Catholic church on in fact the banks until the building of Mount Dinner. And this becomes a linchpin of the community. It's the mid 1850s. The church was actually founded by a French missionary order, the Oblates of Saint uh, of Mary Magdalene. Sorry, the Oblates of Mary Magdalene. And they it's an order that's been founded in France in 1815 with the specific purpose of converting Britain to Catholicism. Um, they came to Leeds at the invitation of a former Anglican uh, vicar, 
who had actually gone over to Catholicism. And so they were invited to Britain. And the first mass on the bank was celebrated. Oh, that's the big cat. That's Robert Cook uh, who invites them. Um, yes. Uh, the first mass was celebrated on the first floor of in fact the Spitalfield Tavern on the bank. Uh, it was also used as a dance floor. Uh, so presumably there were no dances or something uh, when in fact they celebrated uh, the mass. Um, it was in Richmond Street, by the way. And while in fact they were using these premises, they were collecting funds and all um, organizing, uh, they were taking funds all over France to provide the cash for the building of Mount St. Mary's, which was constructed between 1853 and 1856. And those of you who know it, will know it stands high above the bank. It's like a citadel standing very proud. Um, I've gone straight. Oh no, I've gone that one. Um, <laughs> oh. uh, which is not that. Um, now, the old great fathers, when they came to Leeds, actually brought with them a group of old great nuns. And perhaps they're more important than actually the priests that in fact are at the church. They opened a small convent uh, on the bank, and this is it, it's still there. Um, it's not that small, but it's just not, it's not huge. Um, and uh, they also did things like visit the sick and the old. Uh, in their homes, and they organised the first Catholic school in the area. These nuns were the first to come to Leeds since the Reformation. They were considered very strange beings. Uh, people were very curious about them. Now, I grew up in Lancashire, uh, and we were very curious about them. I, I can remember looking at the public. <laughs> From there, it's intimidating. But anyway, um, the the sisters were the objects of great curiosity to the people. So much so that they wouldn't go out even in the cab without being followed by a crowd. And if they ventured to walk in their little garden, or when they visit the sick, they were saluted with various remarks and observations. Sometimes offensive. Oftentimes, very amusing for their simplicity and the astonishment that they express. Uh, in January 1856, the convent was even broken into at night. Uh, but when the offenders were tried, they weren't uh, hostile to them. They just wanted to know what went on. So these like those sorts of questions. What they wanted to know about because they were just exotic creatures or not. Um, but nestling around St Mary, they built, in fact, a whole series of institutes were, which were, were key, really, to the community. Now, there you see Tab Street. You can see it's rising up and Mount St Mary's at the top. Um, now, it may be that I've got very funny tents. But I find these steps one of the most wonderful sights in London. This is, if you'd gone up that street, you'd have then gone up those steps. And although the street's gone, the steps are still there. Mm -hmm. And you can easily imagine the hundreds of thousands of people over the years who made that journey up those steps to go to school, to perhaps visit an old person to go to church. And so it brings back, I say, it resonates in all sorts of ways when I go up those particular steps. And I must admit, I've not been up them for a long time. Um, I think now I've just got a series of sharp slides. That's the church. Next to it is the presbytery. This is the, is it, this church is closed. It is semi-derelict. Again, I could give a whole lecture 
on what has happened at Mount St Mary. I am flabbergasted this could ever, ever happen. Um, but I'm also a bit concerned, I think, would be the word. This is the interior in the 19th century. So we've got the altar with all its mass decoration and elaboration. And of course, we've got the people who are going up Tap Street and up those steps and presumably looking in wonder mm -hmm. at, in fact, the inside. But, you know, their cer material circumstances are just so very different. Now, perhaps I'd tell you that mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a Catholic stock, perhaps I would uh, feel differently if I was. Um, This is a wonderful picture, I think. I've only just come across it. This is actually the, the infant school run by the nuns, 1890s. Um, not, I mean, I've made a copy of a, a copy, so it's not in the best condition, but I think it's really very sweet uh, to see it. So that's the Corpus Christi profession in the 1920s. But of course, they were processing through the streets of the bag on a number of occasions, Corpus Christi is particularly important, but uh, on a number of occasions during the year, it's part of the Catholic calendar to do this. And this is what the military wrote of this process, of a procession in 1895. As the procession wended its way along the principal streets, the rosary recited in some and we felt, for the time being, as if a sudden transformation into a Roman Catholic country had taken place. So the bank is a place apart. It is different. People regarded it as different. Right, so I better speed up. Um, I think this is a bit more. Um, now, apart from, in fact, the religious faith of the, uh, the, the Irish on the bank, they also become involved uh, in Irish politics, that's what it like now. The status of Ireland, what to do about Ireland, was a thread that runs through 19th century history and um, eventually, of course, results in Dabstone's conversion to Home Rule and all that sort of thing. But we're not talking about Home Rule here with three. Um, in 1857, the Irish Republican Brotherhood was founded in New York to advance, by violent means if necessary, the independence of Ireland. Within a few years of its founding in New York, they were organising in Ireland itself. Now, we don't know how serious the how many people were involved. This was certainly in England and in um, the, in Ireland and in England. It was a secret organisation. Uh, so you don't really know much about it. And also, well, that comes to us in a moment. Um, it's very difficult to uh, find how how many people did actually support the Irish um, uh, Republican Brotherhood. But in 1862, J.D. Holford, who was son of the first Catholic mayor of Leeds, in fact, he was the first Catholic mayor in the whole country since the Reformation, when he was elected mayor, I think it was 1836, 1837. So he's the, this was the son, writing to the Leeds Mercury to dissociate our English Catholics from the pervasive nas Irish nationalism of immigrants and their children. So you're getting a fissure opening up between Irish Catholic, uh, English Catholic, who often have been Catholic for centuries, uh, and in fact the Irish Catholic. Um, in uh, April 1865, the Mercury correspondent reported suspicious street corner meetings in the <laughs> uh, now, the Mercury also, at times, warned against what they called scaremongering. But in September, June, in September 1865, James McCarthy, who was an employee of the Hope Foundry in Madgate, 
approached in fact the mayor and asked him to do something to help him. The mayor was Henry Oxford. And he, this is James McCarthy, told Oxford that he was being slandered by his workmates who were spreading rumours that he was the secretary of the Leeds Schemian Society uh, and that he'd expressed the, um, the hatred of the British. Now, this was sufficiently worrying to watch that he decided he got to conduct an inquiry. And he brought McCarthy and he brought the people that McCarthy named as witnesses. And it was all reported in the paper. Um, and some of the witnesses said that, in fact, um, and that McCarthy looked forward to the day when the streets of the streets would be running with Englishmen's blood. Uh, it all went on, really, now the sort of thing in the air. And you see, this an oxidated increase in risk for cock and bull. Uh, but it really was about an argument between that work. But we don't know. And Oxford didn't know. And he did tell McCarthy that he'd got to be much more careful about what he said in public oh. and that he would report to the Home Office this uh, Parada, uh, as he thought of it. In the following year, there were rests of Indians in Dublin, and that included some Irishmen to leave. And there were in these years rumours in the town of making the pipes, secret drilling, uh, a planned uprising to take place inevitably on St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened, but as a precaution, special constables were sworn in to supplement the police force. 1867 was to bring a much more serious, but well, I've written here, 1867 was to bring what was perceived as a much more serious crisis. And I say perceived, because I don't think the Home Office files have been open to this day. It's all too touch. Um, but on the morning of the 11th of February, 1867, 70 females left Wellington Street Station bound for Chester. Now, the day before, on the 10th of February, only one person had left Wellington Street Station. Apparently, the intention of these 70 was to meet up with their fellow students and seize arms and ammunition at Chester Castle. Now, actually, the plot, if it was a plot, was betrayed, uh, and they were all rounded up when they got to Chester. In Leeds, panic was the when the police arrested a young man called Tom Stenton, who was Irish, and he was a shoemaker living in White Hart, White Hart Yard, after he was arrested in Basingford Street, and he was carrying a parcel with 140 rounds of ball cartridge in it. Special guards, the beginning guards of all people, were rushed to leave where they did the Athenian plot was uh, a thought. Uh, they were in the barracks at Chapel Town Road, uh, ready for infant, whatever was going to happen. Now, it had become not just a crisis in Leeds, but really rather a national scare about Athenians continued until the end of the year in September. Well, continued to the end of the year. In September, a policeman was killed in Manchester as some members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood tried to rescue prisoners in a prison van uh, you know, when they were being in fact, moved around. And in uh, the fight that followed, uh, four Irishmen were, uh, sorry, a policeman was killed, four Irishmen were arrested, and eventually they were executed in Manchester, and then known as the Manchester Martyrs. Mm -hmm. In his memoir, 
Walter Harding, the man who was responsible for City Square, uh, and other things, uh, he reports in his private paper that the town was full of rumours of the Irish intention to burn buildings, to seize the arms of the volunteers. This is the voluntary, uh, voluntary armed forces in the, uh, some of which were actually kept in Tower Works, which was, of course, Harding's factory down on Water A. So he was actually restoring um, arms to be used in case there was trouble in these. Um, uh, on the 13th of December, mysterious placards appeared on the walls of streets in the bank. And these said, God save Ireland, a funeral procession in the honour of the Irish Patriots executed in Manchester on November the 23rd will take place in Leeds on Sunday next, the 15th of December. The procession will assemble at Vickers Cross, which is where the market is, and will start at 2 pm. And they will parade the streets of Leeds till they reach St. Patrick's Cemetery. Now, this is the old St. Patrick's. We actually have a graveyard. The building that we know at St. Patrick's still, uh, because by then, Curry the King King Beverly. Um, so that's, and then the placard went on. All of us of Ireland, men and women, are requested to attend and to show their respect to the memory of their fellow countrymen. But well, the magistrate was bound. Uh, but preparations were made to for a show of force in these. People were panicking. A special constables were sworn in, troops from the seventh. Uh, for the 17th Regiment uh, and for the Royal Artillery and the Leeds Yeomanry were all strategically placed around the town in case the procession took place. Harding himself was enrolled as a special constable and he spent a number of nights in the town hall with his fellow special constable waiting to be called for duty. Well, duty never came. Uh, and you stayed to help in poetry concerts. Uh, so it was all very jolly in the end. Um, now, was this a hoax? That's the question. We don't know. Who put the placards up? Was it provocateurs uh, who wanted to show down with the Irish? Was it the end? We have no idea. Uh, the procession never took place of, in fact, Irish people. What did take place was a procession of all these blessed troops that they got <laughs> to wander through the town, up to St. Patrick's, as if, in fact, they were the, the march, and then came back to these, and they were followed by, there wasn't an Irish in the streets, by the way, except for Irish children, who taunted the troops by singing the wearing of the green. <laughs> so I think that that point I will see. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, now I'm not particularly an expert on the Irish. Uh, it's not my my, my field. But uh, has anybody any questions? We've got some time. Just a wee bit. Anybody any burning questions? My um, son was the last to be one of the oh, yeah. and when he took over, that was 20 years ago now, uh, the basement of the Cobra was supposed to be a meeting place for the IRA. It does seem to me that it's quite a way, uh, away from the centre, the, the Irish centre. Well, they did, I mean, one of the things which I didn't get round to, but because time was running out, is if you look at the position of Roman Catholic churches in Leeds. Um, I mean, I've described the first one, but if you then, in fact, track them down, you are able to, in fact, trace, in a way, the movement of the Irish, or some of the Irish, out of the bank. So you've got a Catholic church in Burley, for example, mm -hmm. built, I think, in the 1880s. So, obviously, there's enough Irish Catholics living in Burnley, and you find, you know, uh, 
in fact, in, in Armley and, and various other places, early, you know, late 90s, early 20th century Catholic churches, there are larger catering for the Irish, and therefore there must be a local Irish community. Um, I don't know about the Coburg. Certain pubs were always connected with the Irish in Leeds, uh, or they were in my lifetime. And in, in fact, you know, people I've spoken to who can remember, particularly on Regent Street, the Regent, for example, okay. was a big Irish pub even when, when I came to Leeds in the 1960s. Uh, and so you've got pubs that specialised, I think, in, well, to the outsider like me who would be in them, they specialised in Irish folk music and Irish singing. Mm-hmm. You know, there were a good crack was going to the Irish pub. Now, whether there was another world which outsiders like me well, would not have been aware of, I don't know. This is quite secret in the sense that uh, the, the quite extensive cellars. Uh, yes, and, yes. And it was very much underground. Very secret, yeah. I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, it, it was, no, I wouldn't know. But yeah, that seems like it. You know. So that the manufacturers in the to encourage the Irish to come here because they were short of labour. Yeah. And a lot of them came from the west of Ireland. Yeah. How did they do that? Because most of them couldn't read or write. How did they advertise that they needed labour? I music? think that there well, certainly there would be placards put up in Ireland saying yeah. that there are jobs in, in these. Uh, and it wouldn't be just Leeds doing this, it's particularly Lancashire actually. Mm. Um, and they, I don't think they ever subsidise uh, the, the travel costs. I'm not aware that they did, but as I said, I'm not really an expert in this. Um, but what it would be would be largely word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, if placards appeared, mm-hmm. they would be read, as with everything, mm-hmm. uh, they would be read by the literate person in the village, or perhaps even the priest, mm-hmm. who probably would be literate. Uh, it would be read by them, and they would all listen, they would know, and word would spread. You know, there's work in the or uh, you know, uh, and I said they were here before the fact. Um, when in fact wasn't Apache mm. owners, they'd come then as their own volition, uh, because of the ruination of the textile yeah. trade in Ireland. And so the second question is how did they how did they get across Ireland? How could they afford it if they were so poor? Well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean they might yeah. well walk. Uh, yeah. people, you know, if a woman can walk 28 oh, yeah. miles to Tancaster and back to sell some maps, they can walk across Ireland. Well, yeah. My family came from, from there to Dublin, it's 250 miles. Well, you might walk. If you're desperate, you'll walk it, won't you? Yeah. Uh, but how did you then pay for the passage? Yeah, exactly. That's and I don't know the answer. Um, there may have been Catholic charities, you did. Right. I don't know. I don't know. Um, there was certainly, yeah, uh, uh, you'd have to look at something on the history of Ireland. Yeah, because a lot of the reading I've done in the past, it extends all about the famine and the emigration, but it never tells you how the people did it. Mm. How did they get there? I mean, if there were people here, mm. we're well, talking about the famine, there are Irish people already living. They may have sent money yeah. back. Mm. Uh, because remember, we always think that the Irish are arriving with the famine, but they don't, they arrived long before that. So if you come to Leeds in the 90, in the 1820s, although you were poor and you remained relatively poor, you probably did have enough money. You know, if your your brother is starving in Ireland, you can send him some money to make this possible. But whether in fact that's dealt with in the literature, I, I really just don't know. But you're right, there are practicalities to all this, aren't there? Um, yes? Yeah, there's a Fenton pub on the way to the university, which yeah. might be described as on the corner of the Leylands or mm-hmm. sort of. No, it's not. No, okay, where no, is it? The Leylands is uh, off North Street. Mm-hmm. North Street. Okay, fair yeah. enough. But I'm saying there is a Fenton pub. Yeah. What's the history of that, please? Well, is it after this Fenton? Um, the Fentons were a very, very famous. Um, West York, West Riding family. They're great coal owners, they own potteries, they own brickworks, they are also Leeds merchants. And that Fenton pub is built on land 
that I think Isabella Fenton, it's a, a woman who owned it. So she sold it. Uh, and no uh, this Fenton. Like Miss A. B. No relation to Martha Fenton. Like Miss Hear that. One of the masters, I believe you said, was on Fenton. I misheard you. I think you must have. Yeah, because, sorry, okay, okay, so okay, so but the Fenton pub is that its oh, history is known and it is named after this. Unfortunately, the Fenton, if you look at local history and West Riding history, the Fenton's right. crop up all the time. They're a huge family, but so unfortunately, <clears throat> they always call their eldest child James. <laughs> so that you may you end up with like 40 James Fentons. Uh, they live around Castleford and all around there, as well as in these. Right. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, when was the first Irish immigrant come to Leeds? I don't know. Uh, um, they, let me see, do I know anybody? Uh, I really don't know. Um, the earliest one I did in the Parking Parties. Yes, I mean, no, I, I don't know, but I'm not at all surprised that, you know, uh, I mean, next week when I'm talking about the Chinese, I mean, the first Chinese person in these, who's documented, is in fact 1850, uh, which is so person. Um, but people had uh, the, the Chinese. Uh, idiosyncratically, you know, crop up in the 18th, 17th centuries and so on. So I, I don't really know, and I'm not sure that anybody would know when the very first one was. Remember, Ireland um, was uh, had a very long connection. It's not very far, is it, you see, <laughs> from mainland Britain. And it just had a very, very long connection uh, that will go back many, many centuries. <laughs> Because there were always some English Catholics, <clears throat> and although the people who kept Catholicism alive in Britain out of the Reformation were on the whole great aristocrats. Uh, but great aristocrats insisted that those who lived on their patch in their manor were Roman Catholics. I mean, we protected as Roman Catholics. That is just fun. Um, <clears throat> at one time, Preston, this is a fact I trot out all the time because I find it so remarkable, Preston was the only place in post-Reformation England to ever have a Catholic majority in his population. Uh, so in 1850, there were more Catholics in Preston uh, than there were in that Protestant, mm -hmm. which is just incredible. Uh, but obviously, so sure. there were poor Catholics. Uh, they weren't all rich aristocrats, and therefore there was no problem about his marriage. Mm -hmm. Later, lots of uh, Irish men married English women, which is, again, a common immigrant experience. Um, in the case of those marriages, you had to, if you're going to be married in a Catholic church, you had to promise to bring your children mm -hmm. up as family. Mm -hmm. uh, so that there was a lot of intermarriage, but the children of those marriages <coughs> actually were brought up as Catholic. What we don't know is how far they remain Catholic after they had um, uh, they finished their schooling. They would go to Catholic school, uh, but whether they would remain Catholic when they had a Protestant mother who may not attend. And I mean, the other thing about Irish men, there is certain evidence in Ireland from Irish historians that Irish men in the West of Ireland weren't very religious. They've got better things to do on the Women went to church, prayed on their husband's behalf, uh, but they did, didn't actually go themselves. Uh, so you've got all these sort of strange imbalances. So, 
Irish men marrying English wives, then you should her children were brought up as Catholic, but they didn't necessarily go very often to church either. And often, sometimes the wives converted, but this is always. Uh, yeah, that's what it's all, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So there must be figures, but I don't know them. Well, yes. Have you got anything on the uh, Irish and uh, West Indian uh, marriages that happened more in the 50s and the 60s? Oh, not at all. Are we not up to date at that point? No, yet? I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. Uh, and happened a lot in North London. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Um, of course, the one of the movements of the Irish uh, from the band was into Chapel Town, which explains the Catholic Church there, uh, which is I've always called Holy Rosary. I'm not sure whether it's got a more yeah. that now, but um, that was the, known as the Irish Church. Um, now that was. Uh, he had a congregation that lived locally, even as in fact the West Indians were coming. They were still an Irish community in Chapel Town. It's not so big now, but there was. Uh, and that was their church. Now we must remember that some West Indians are Roman Catholic. Uh, and therefore they would attend that church when it was built. There was an earlier Holy Rosary, which was on Barrett Street. But uh, yeah, so there will be some, but so, I have no idea. There was idea a man on the end of my street who had the most amazing ginger afro. So that that is as loud yes. as it gets, okay. really. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yes. Anybody, anything else? Hmm. When did you say the bank was cleared? Was it 1930? Yeah, it was actually in a very large number, uh, extensively, in the 1930s. And then they finished the job off in the 1950s. And certainly when I used to first go there, uh, it was decimated. It was just acres and acres of wasteland with, in fact, Mount St. Mary standing at one side with all its associated buildings. And then St. Saviour's Church, which was the Anglican church at the other. And around them, there was just nothing at all. Uh, and it was all... Uh, originally, I remember being uh, friendly with a woman who was a uh, local activist there. The council originally said it was scheduled for industry and that it wasn't to be built on. So there wasn't to be houses on the bank anymore. So once, in fact, it had been scheduled in local plans as for industrial purposes, that meant that those houses were never replaced. Uh, now they are building again on the, house, on the bank. Uh, oh, they won't call it the bank room anymore. But they won't call it the bank, but there. Uh, and of course, the industry never, in fact, replaced the houses that they've moved. Uh, but it did have a very bad reputation. And I think one of the reasons why the council wanted to schedule it in the way that they did was because people in Leeds could remember what the bank uh, meant. Uh, and they would have had difficulty filling council houses that were on the bank, which is why they changed the name. Presumably the landlords of the houses on the bank yeah. were English. Yes. Yeah. Well, don't think I'll go down that way. <laughs> well, but yes, basically there were, yes. And they would all receive compensation when in fact the councils cleared it, yes. Okay, well, I think we need to go. <laughs> So thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you some of you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.